on healthcare for med tech topic. So um, I guess this is a first for us, um, and we're super thrilled um, to have Claudio tonight with us. For those who um, haven't been to so many Startup Grind events, let me explain to you in a couple of uh, sentences what we try to do. So this is a non-for-profit. We do this on the side and parallel to our job. Um, but what we try to aim at is uh, nurturing the ecosystem of entrepreneurship in Munich. Startup Grind is an association that started in 2010 uh, in Silicon Valley and then has reached now, um, if I'm not mistaken, 600 chapters, so 600 cities in 120 countries. That means that in each city you have a team um, who is trying to bring to life um, the stories of hidden entrepreneurs, hidden champions, um, to share um, their, their insights on a certain industry, to share their journey in building great companies. Um, so I'm Spin, I'm the chapter director um, of Munich. I've joined Startup Grind now three years ago. Um, we've done plenty of events, and as I said, it's our first healthcare topic. But this is also a first for someone else who just joined the team, um, and he's um, now uh, helping us to bring this to life. Um, I'd like to welcome to Startup Grind Ulrike, who is our co director and who is also going to do the interview um, tonight. So it's not going to be me, but I'm handing over to Ulrike um, for this uh, first fireside chat. Um, I hope uh, you got some drinks, some food, um, and that you stay after uh, the first chat with us to mingle. Um, we'll have plenty of other events, but now the stage is yours. Um, welcome, Claudio, and we hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you also great for me being here. Um, great to you all here. Um, yeah, maybe short introduction to our topic today. Um, when I started with some research on um, Monero and Claudio, I first went on the website, of course. And what I read there got my attention immediately, immediately, because when you go there, you read, we believe that with Monero we can help people with mobility and independence. We put the human being in the focus. And for me that was something very special because I'm also coming from the field of technology and digitization. And there are so many solutions outside there that like trying to fit a market to make like profit, but they don't even try to solve a real problem. And what I'm seeing with Monevo is that they're solving a real problem and that was super fascinating for me. So what is Monevo doing? They, um, most of you of course know, but I will also introduce it a little bit. Uh, Monevo has uh, developed a smart class application for wheelchair users so that they can, can uh, control their wheelchair by moving their head. So that means a huge gain in autonomy and also a rising the, the quality in their lives. So for us it's super good to have Claudio tonight here. So welcome and we're happy to hear your story now. start, um, as you may have seen, we are recording that. We just have to tell you because of privacy topics, but we don't have you on the picture, but just in case you want to ask questions, you can ask questions in between, but we can also make a, we will make a short Q&A at the end of the interview, and then we can turn the camera off if you want to ask something that should not be on the video recording. <laughs> just in case, I don't know. <laughs> Great. Then, um, let's start. So, when you started in 2015, as I remember, with like a small project at the university, um, and then looking to now, now you have uh, like 12 people in your team. That's a pretty good story, but I will go into that right afterwards, but I want to start a little bit earlier. Um, so, did you always want to become an entrepreneur, a founder? Did you always want to start a startup? Or have you been born like with this entrepreneurial spirit? Or where did you come from? What was your um, No, so not at all. Uh, I wasn't prepared to be an entrepreneur. Uh, so I was, I was born in Romania. Um, when I was seven, I moved to Germany. Um, I started studying, also first uh, in my family, and then uh, 
while studying this idea I came up and usually I was working always as a, as a part-time consultant. So I always thought, okay, I'm going to become a consultant, work, and then like, yeah, be successful in that way. But um, this idea just happened by coincidence, um, and then everything turned around, and now I'm, I'm yeah, I launched a company. Um, it's doing very well, um, and I, I never imagined that I would be an entrepreneur. So when you in your childhood, um, everybody's like, I want to become a, I don't know. Did you also have something like this? Did you want to become? That's a good you question. Remember? No, I, I actually don't know. Okay. No. But no entry. Probably a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty <good. laughs> Yeah. Um, but firemen also help you. Exactly. So. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you already mentioned now you started this project or this startup by coincidence, really. How did it come? Uh, so we, back in 2015, we were the first university at the uh, Technical University of Munich um, that uh, was able to work with smart glasses. It was together with uh, BMW, the big car manufacturer, and the topic was around mobility. So immediately all of the other student teams um, yeah, tried to do an idea that is around, around automotive. But our supervisors and professors told us that we can do anything we want, just have to be creative and use it in a smart way. Um, and one of my, my colleagues at that time, he did his civil service in a home for disabled persons. And in that home there were a lot of wheelchair users. And that's how in the end we got the idea to connect the glass to the wheelchair um, and see what happens. What happened? <laughs> what happened was that the first like uh, couple of months we, we didn't know where to start because we were all information systems students, we didn't do anything with engineering, um, let alone medical products or anything. So we first tr started to get our hands on a wheelchair and that was already a big challenge because no one could give us one. So um, until, I don't know, month three or four, uh, we finally got one and then we started developing and Thing worked. Um, we were quite well on the on the software side because we knew how to code, but uh, but on the engineering side there was like a lot of things that we needed to learn. So somehow in the end we made it work like really last minute so that the wheelchair could turn left and right. But uh, that was the the final um, prototype that we showed at the end in the university. But we got a great feedback. So. As, as we went outside and we tried to get the wheelchair, we got in touch with many wheelchair users, with uh, clinics, doctors, and uh, rehab shops, mm -hmm. to also understand, okay, what's happening? Like, how are wheelchairs even working? What's this joystick or anything that, mm -hmm. that is uh, about that? So we got to learn a lot. Um, and we got to learn also a lot of stories from users that were nice, not nice, uh, motivating, and. We understood that somehow that, uh, that the wheelchairs haven't really changed or there wasn't a lot of innovation happening in that area mm -hmm. and uh, the joysticks that you might know, they didn't change for 20, 30 years. That's a long time. Um, yeah. Um, did you have the feeling that the wheelchair producers didn't see the urgency for that or the need for changing something at that time? Yes, yes, I would say so because the, the industry itself is very traditional, conservative, so it's a lot about mechanical mm -hmm. stuff. You build stuff with like metal and everything. So software and digital things or like innovations as it is mm -hmm. didn't happen so much yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we also decided, but not just because of that, but also because of the, the stories from the users that got our attention and all mm -hmm. innovation started. So the, the first uh, wheelchair you got for uh, trying it and, and making like a feasibility studies or something like that, mm -hmm. um, where did you get it from? In the end it was one of the manufacturers that said, okay, here's a very old wheelchair that we don't use anymore, mm -hmm. um, give it a go. Okay. Um, and then we did and then after we showed them the, the final prototype um, mm -hmm. that was kind of working, um, they were really amazed by it, so they said, okay, keep the wheelchair, try to continue your development, and that's what we did. Uh, we continued to further develop it, we 
uh, did it next to our studies, next to our part-time work, and then um, that's, um, that helped us not only financially, but like to really then 100% focus on this topic um, after our studies. Mm -hmm. So the time you had this uh, project at university was like six months? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then afterwards you decided to continue, but yeah. you already mentioned you were also working as consultant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were studying. Yeah. How 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 could you manage, or did you um, ask you that question, or you just did it? I just did it. Yeah. I, I don't know how I managed it in the end, but mm -hmm. somehow it worked, and uh, I was it was basically at the end of my study, so I just uh, mm -hmm. had like two or three courses, two or three exams, and uh, the the final thesis. Um, so the final thesis was flexible, I could do it whenever I wanted, I didn't have to be in, in class or anything, so mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't remember, but I, I think I did it over the weekend. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, how long did you do this in, in parallel, like working and doing this process? So from, from the beginning of 2015 mm -hmm. until I finished in October 2016. Mm -hmm. so more than a year. Yeah, yeah. But there was a huge gap in between where there was some mm -hmm. um, other challenges that I had to deal with. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically then um, with this team that we found, mm -hmm. we started the project, um, it went really well, we mm -hmm. developed, 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 and at some point there was this decision to be made, okay, are we really going to focus 100% with the government grant and so on? Mm -hmm. And then uh, all of the teammates didn't want to continue, uh, I was basically the only one left. Uh, and I didn't want to like just leave it as it is, and then I, I started to look for new for a new team. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Um, I did multiple things. So mm -hmm. I reached out throughout all Facebook groups, startup founder search, and so on. Um, I reached out through LinkedIn to through the Unternehmertum Netzwerk from mm -hmm. the TU Munich. Um, uh, in the end, I was uh, I was very not really successful with that. It started then later, but. Uh, the most successful thing that I did is just take the wheelchair with me and drive around the campus in, in the university. <laughs> and the cool thing about that is that the wheelchair, when it's connected to the glasses, it's wireless. So you don't necessarily have to sit inside the wheelchair, but you can drive it from somewhere behind the, a tree or a door. So people would think it's driving on its own. <laughs> uh, and that's how I met then, finally, also the Pesh is here, but also Ashish. Um, <laughs> who were both at that time studying informatics, mm -hmm. um, so that's how it started. I found these two guys, then I found uh, a medical student mm -hmm. that helped us also with the medical side, mm -hmm. and finally to a friend of a friend we also found an engineer, so that we really had the balanced team of all different um, areas that we needed to, to continue. But you didn't know each other at all at the beginning, so no. you just found these guys I was really right. lucky, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would you, would you say it was really luck or or also how did you decide to, to take them on board? Um, I remember I just told them, guys, so I have this idea, I think mm -hmm. it's really gonna, going to work because we have so many people mm -hmm. um, that already like gave us so much feedback and they, they asked us how long is it going to take until you finalize this and then it was just, okay, let's do it. So there was not uh, not a lot of discussions um, going on. Just doing it. Just doing it, yeah. And did you think about um, like finding people to help you that have kind of um, background in medical stuff or something, or was that something that you didn't think that much about? Or yes and no. Maybe okay. it would have been smarter to find someone with some expert knowledge on medical products because that was the next big challenge. <laughs> um, so we had this medical student who helped us mm -hmm. with that uh, specific topic but also in the end uh, he also had to leave because of his doctor so then we, we didn't have any medical background um, so uh, we had to work on this on our own to get an understanding of all the medical product area and what we need to do with regards to uh, certification, what you need to test, uh, clinical studies, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was hard. Yeah, I think that finding a good team and also co-founders that yeah that fit at the end is um, a thing that many founders are struggling with. Many people are looking for good co-founders that yeah 
of the values of some kind have to fit. Um, what would you advise if you would speak to other founders? What should they look like? At like if it fits on an emotional level or if they should bring the background in the industry where you want to start to make your startup. What would you say? What's bit, important? Yeah, so I, I think a bit of everything. Um, for for my case. I think the, the, to understand the vision of the goal of the whole journey um, and that is still like implemented until today so our vision is to help uh, people in the end mm -hmm. and uh, this is our main task and goal in the company so if you, if you try to find people according to that vision and goal to understand it uh, I think that's your best shot but also taking into account the balanced team and um, all the necessary like expertise that you need to mm -hmm. um, at that time what was your vision was it already like the same that you told us now or yeah so at that time there was this like switch in, in, in my personal motivation when I, I stopped thinking about becoming a, a consultant mm -hmm. but I really switched to like becoming like an entrepreneur that can help people in the end um, and it started with all these, this information about the, the people, what they have to go through, how their lives are depending on these kind of technologies, um, the different stories that really can motivate you a lot and then also the reaction when you talk about it and then when they test it finally, even if it's not working really, but they still understand that the impact that it can, it can um, make on their lives then in the end. Um, when you started with continuing with the product, uh, the, the project, and you were still in consultancy, mm -hmm. did you think to, to quit consultant, the consultant job one day, or were you still like, okay, I will be consultant, but I like this project and I will give it a try? Or what was your, what were you thinking about? So I was always thinking I need to stop doing other things on the side, I need to really focus on this. Mm -hmm. um, because there was so much work that needs to be done and I couldn't have another job as a side thing going on. So that, that was always the, the, the goal to like quit this, finish your studies. That's what my mom told me, finish your studies. <laughs> and then uh, continue this full time and full focus on, on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what are your parents? Saying about that you're well, founder now, another consultant. Yeah, well, they, they, <laughs> they still like have challenges to understand what I'm doing. Um, we're getting there, <laughs> but uh, at first uh, they they said like, okay, you do it, but if it doesn't work, don't do it. Go to BMW, be a consultant or something else. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't really. Uh, they didn't understand what I'm doing, but like I said, we're getting there. They understand it better and better, day by day. But would you say that your uh, work at the consultancy could help you in some way now or at the time when you started with the startup? Definitely. So all, all of the, the, the expertise that I, or like the knowledge that I gained, or like the, the methods that I, I got from the consultancy of like for how to communicate, how to work professionally, how to do some project management and all of these things. Like they definitely helped me um, in some form how I use it also now for, for the company or for the startup. Um, so it really helped me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so at that time you already had found your new team and you were like going through all the medical know-how stuff and so on. Did you also have mentors at the time? Um, yes, so that was, that was again being very lucky to, to study at Technical University of Munich where you have a, a, an amazing network and a, a lot of like coaches that help you with like certain topics when it is about financing or when it is about how to even set up a company. Um, and then from the beginning on we, we had the chance to get early on a mentor that was from the um, TU Munich network. Um, who was already a medical technology expert who already sold his company successfully and is now just like investing in other companies and who already also had some experience with wheelchair industry because he invested in another startup that is doing some other form of wheelchair. Um, so he helped us also a lot from the beginning. Okay, so also getting the knowledge 
that you were kind of missing a little bit in the team yeah. from from a mentor. Yep. Okay. So how did you get from that very good going project with your new team to a successful business model? What was the way? Um, what was the way? The way was we had to work through many medical product regulatory and regulations and laws, um, talking to a lot of experts, um, getting the product ready and still we're still developing more and more functions and features right now. Um, but as soon as we had really a clear path towards the regulatory side, so we knew, okay, this is what steps need to be done, and this is what steps need to be done for the product, then we were pretty clear on that. And uh, after that, there was another phase where we had to um, think about yeah, the business model and how we can get it to the user. But that was also, again, straightforward, where you understand the reimbursement process of medical products in Germany or Europe. Um, so that went really well because we finalized our certification for the product within one and a half years mm -hmm. until end of 2018 and then in 2019 we were already on the road and testing, showing it to the insurance companies and medical distributors and within three months, which was really quick, we had the first reimbursement. So the first official user that got uh, the reimbursement from the healthcare insurance could officially use it. And before that, we obviously had a lot of other test users that we were testing with, mm -hmm. but that was our first official. Mm -hmm. And um, did you already have like first uh, customers like that wanted to have the product before you had this clarified all the regulations? Yeah, yeah. So from from the clinical study onwards, we already like targeted people mm -hmm. um, that were using some other form of control. And from those people, we went on and now trying to um, give them the reimbursed, uh, try them to have the product reimbursed in the end. And also from before, there were some users that are now, um, we're now in the process of getting their reimbursement. Afterwards, how do you get user uh, right now? Right, right now, we, we started in, in the beginning of 2019 and we did a, it's called the roadshow, where you visit a lot of hospitals or medical distributors. And uh, they usually then know some, some users and they get, they get in contact with them and they invite us so we go there and test. Um, but we also have, in, in Germany, we have I think over 20 or 30 medical distributors, mm -hmm. rehab shops, that we already trained, that uh, have already maybe a demo unit from us. So they can do their, the, their user test without us and any time they need some support, they just call us and then we, we drive there and help them. To, to do the test. Okay, so you're mainly uh, contact with distributors or also with clinics or what are your main stakeholders on the market? Yeah, so there's the, the medical distributors, there's the clinics and then we also work with wheelchair manufacturers. Um, in the beginning they were not so supportive because they didn't think it would work. Mm -hmm. Now they're contacting us and want to work with us and uh, there we, we try to get on their um, yeah, when, when a rehab shop wants to order a wheelchair, then now when they order the wheelchair, they can just make a sign for additional add-ons and we will be there as an add-on that uh, we can order together. Mm -hmm. With the clinics and the distributors, was it also hard to convince them, like with the manufacturers, or was no, it easier? No, it was very easy. So usually okay. they, they didn't believe it when we were talking on the phone, and then as soon as we went there and we showed them and they tried it out, they were already convinced. Okay. Yeah. Mm, nice. Interesting. <laughs> um, would you say that um, how how many manufacturers are you now connected with, or how many manufacturers are there on the market? So there are not a lot. There are between eight to ten, maybe more, maybe twelve, um, and we're connected to almost all of them. So we're missing one or two in the US, um, and maybe some from China, but uh, other than that, we're connected to all of them. Mm -hmm. And where do your customers come from, mainly? So in, in, it's mainly Germany still, or is it Europe-wide, or...? Yeah, so um, we have already customers in Austria and Switzerland. Um, well, I would say we have already users in 
Germany, Austria, Switzerland, but we have already also customers of, for example, demo units in um, in Denmark, in uh, Norway, in uh, uh, we're launching now France and Netherlands. Uh, in Israel, we had a demo unit, um, and we had already meetings with the Ministry of Health there. Um, so it's ongoing. We're receiving a lot of like requests from users from clinics um, all around the world. Okay, and, and how how do you get into new markets? What's is there a normal process, or is each country different? It depends. So first first thing is that yeah, it is depending on country to country. So you have different healthcare systems. For example, in the UK, you have a centralized system with the NHS. So you have one really institutions that you have to contact. Whereas in, um, um, let's say, Netherlands, for example, the municipalities will decide if the user will get the product reimbursed. So there is another like uh, task that we have to like work on to understand the different healthcare systems throughout the world. And then uh, our next steps is also um, moving to the U.S. That in um, where you require uh, another certification. So for Europe, you have a CE certification, but for the U.S., you need a FDA certification. Okay, so that would be one of your next steps. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Is it more complicated? Than well, it depends. Uh, some say it's more complicated, some say no. Uh, in the end, since you already went through the process of the CE certification, the, the requirements are quite similar. So we have already a lot of documentation that we can use for FDA, um, but we still need to review what's missing, where are some gaps that we need to fill. Mm -hmm. um, so in your solution now, you have, like you already mentioned at the beginning, you have a part that is hardware and you have a software part. What's the easier one? software part <laughs> because you don't need to do a lot of testing and hardware tests and uh, EMD and whatsoever tests so there is a lot of um, things that you need to do when you do a hardware product um, and then the software so our vision is to use the smart glass as a platform and then add software features as we go to improve the, the life quality um, like mm -hmm. you mentioned in the beginning um, and that's the easier part because that's our core competence. We can really develop very well uh, software. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what add-ons should come? So right now we we already implemented uh, the drive functions where you can drive your wheelchair. But uh, on top of that, you can already change the seating position. You can connect the glass to your phone, to your um, to your smartphone, to your computer, and control that. And uh, we already can control also uh, a kind of a robotic arm that is also again directed for people that cannot grab a glass and drink on their own. So the robot arm will help them. But when you, the robot arm needs to be controlled by a joystick. But again, when you cannot do that because of your hands, mm -hmm. um, then uh, our glass can now control the robot arm to make you drink. Um, and the next ones are uh, connecting it to your smart home environment so that people can um, connect to their lights, turn it on and off to the TV, mm -hmm. uh, to heaters and, and other, other uh, devices. Okay, so I get like, I have once the hardware and I can upgrade it over yep. the time with the software. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you already mentioned it now that hardware is kind of a little bit difficult. So looking at your whole story or maybe the last two, three years, what were the things that were really, really challenging? What didn't let you sleep at night? What were you worried about? Um, so in the beginning there was the, the missing team. So that was the first challenge. Then after that we worked really hard on the certification for medical products, um, which included the clinical study, which we also have designed and developed and um, also did it successfully in the end by ourselves. Um, and then finally getting to the first uh, user, first official user that was reimbursed. Yeah, that was the main things. So many challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, many at different times. Yeah. But w what, what kept you motivated at that time? What was your driver when you were facing the challenges? Yeah, so in the end, again, um, the 
best motivation was within the, the users that like mm -hmm. tested it, that contacted us, that still contact us until today from different parts of the country. Um, I think last week, I think it was last week, I went to Norway because a user had contacted us and we, we tested and it worked and they were very happy. Um, and then of course also the team in the end because we really grew stronger as we moved <coughs> on. Um, I think one of our first employees now had the official first year, so that was a big uh, celebration. And we need to celebrate even more um, because <laughs> the other guys, time. yeah, so there's a lot of like uh, annual celebrations now <laughs> going to start. <laughs> so, would you say celebrating also the success is super important for Super important, yes, I would definitely say so. How do you celebrate in your company? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> we did many things, um, starting from escape game rooms, going to bowling, um, disco bowling. Um, we went uh, and had picnic in the park, we went go-karting, we did a lot of fun stuff. Uh, we went on a boat, that was the first. Um, just the founders, a little getaway to yeah, think about, reflect and, and, and talk about different topics and now the anniversary of our first uh, um, employee, La Vita, we, we celebrated with cake and some drinks in the office. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, when celebrating successes, what would you say what was, uh, what were the most successful milestones in your company history so far? Um, all in all, the, the complete certification, including the clinical trial, that was a big success mm -hmm. and we celebrated. Um, and then afterwards, again, the, the first official reimbursement, we were very happy that it went on and it, we got it really fast. Um, and now we, it's every time a celebration when we get a new user um, that can use the product and it's reimbursed. So every time the, the user success. Mm -hmm. um, so you started here in Munich because yeah, you were studying here first, so it was kind of logical that you started with the startup also here. What would you say about the ecosystem here in Munich in, in the e-health set in the tech the health tech sector? Is it yep. very supportive? What's what's your experience? So when we started it was quite a challenge. Um, I think we were one of the first or like one of the first or there were many others as well but in our case we were having a lot of hard time to understand medical technology. Um, the Technical University of Munich was amazing because they tried really to, to direct us into the right direction and I think EIT Health was founded in 2016. Operational <laughs> since 2016. Operational since 2016. <laughs> yes. So we were very lucky that you started at that time because then um, we had the chance to really like deep dive into a great network. Um, we were participating in all of the EIT Health programs, met their boot camp. Um, we won EIT Head Start Award, where you should apply if you want 50,000 euros. September 12th. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were part of the EIT Accelerator and Yes Delft, which is in the Netherlands, which was also an amazing program. So I would say that with EIT Health and with the Technical University of Munich, you really got a huge um, yeah, you really have huge opportunities to get help not only for your industry um, knowledge, like from EIT Health, but also then for things like marketing, finance, um, and all these kinds of stuff. Are you thinking about also going to other cities, like having a second office in the future or something? Yeah, so I think we would be happy to have offices in the U.S. So in the U.S.? Yeah, that would be Why in the U.S.? Just because it's a really huge opportunity and we have a lot of requests already from there, not only from users, but from distributors, from manufacturers. Um, and there are many, many more people there that uh, require this kind of product or this kind of uh, help in the end. Mm -hmm. So if somebody would like to start a startup over here in Munich in the health tech sector, what would you advise the founders? Mm -hmm. Um, if you're not starting from university but you're already advanced and like 
maybe already have a work and want to like start, I think the best way if you're in healthcare is to really join the IT Health Network um, because they're the guys you should talk to when you need help with that. So. <laughs> am, I, am I doing too much? <laughs> <laughs> So that's not like it's it's real deal. Um, if you are in health tech, EIT Health is really uh, supportive. And also yeah. right now, uh, with the help of EIT Health, we will try to launch in the Netherlands and France um, the next coming months. Mm -hmm. So if we, and from maybe from the team side perspective, like knowledge, experiences, would you say that like you had it working first in a yeah, like in a consultancy or? Is important or not? No, I, I wouldn't say so. So I think um, the only one who has startup experience is actually the fish. He was working in a, in a startup in India which was sold to Amazon. Um, and then all the others were recent graduates who didn't have a lot of experience or just like me. I also didn't have so much experience. It was just really part time. Mm -hmm. because, um, so um, Konstantin, the, the engineer in our team, he's just really passionate and he's the mm -hmm kind of guy who builds things. He builds like his own motorcycle in his garage. Um, Ashish just had like current uh, past experiences with people with disabilities and he, he developed already some software for, for um, people with disabilities. Um, and so you don't need necessarily like a lot of experience to start. We really grew into our roles and into this, into this journey um, to create a product, a medical product that is then reimbursed by yeah. Public insurance. And when, like, getting first contact with insurances, with the distributors, like you already mentioned that all, are there some, like, do's and don'ts you would like to share with people that would like to go the same way? Or <coughs> yeah, so, <coughs> I think as a general advice, I would say, um, stop writing so many emails, pick up the phone and call. Uh, and then you can write your email, but first of all, call. That's very much more efficient, and you don't, um, yeah, waste a lot of time. Um, and then the, the second advice is, um, I forgot it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know it. You don't know it. No, I also don't know it. <laughs> Maybe you'll come back. We can talk later. I'll, I'll have it later. Of course. Okay. And also for yourself, when you could go back to any point, is there something you would change, you would like to tell yourself, besides that one Pick advice maybe? maybe? Um, yeah, I have it now again. So when we, when we started <laughs> in, uh, in 2015 and then our mentor joined and he was always telling me like, you're really overthinking, like really just do it and, and you'll see what happens. So at that time when we started and also in the beginning with the new team, we were still like thinking a lot, overthinking a lot, trying to make the product really perfect, trying to make everything perfect. So I think um, back then we just have, we should have just like do it and then uh, see what happens. Maybe one last question before we are opening up to the others. Um, how are you moving forward? What are the next steps? What's coming up? Um, well, next, like I mentioned, we're trying now with DIT Health to uh, enter the Netherlands and France. Um, that will be really the next month. Uh, we are in two or three exhibitions. We we'll present again the product. Uh, we are working on the, on the systems in, in, in Norway as well. And first and foremost, we will focus on the U.S. launch that includes FDA and um, a lot of other topics that we need to deal with. Setting up an entity in the U.S., doing the whole tax uh, things that you need to do for, for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also working with different features. Um, so the smart home feature will hopefully be launched soon. We are developing a new piece of hardware. <laughs> you know we shouldn't, but we're doing it. <laughs> Um, that will be launched in 2020. Um, we are always doing more research on new technologies um, like smart glasses, but also other technologies that are 
related to eye tracking or human brain interfaces. Um, so we have a lot of things to do. And we're also raising a new investor round. So if anyone knows someone. <laughs> so when you're thinking like about 2025 we will be more than 100 employees <laughs> with a real software team, tech stack, everything included um, already live worldwide uh, with different products uh, and growing basically, trying to grow and help as many people as we can.